Welcome to the Open Forum, a telephone talk program designed to give you the opportunity to ask questions and discuss issues related to the Bible. Our host is Harold Camping of Family Stations Incorporated. The phone number is 1-800-322-5385. That's 1-800-322-5385. When you call, allow the phone to keep ringing. Your call will be answered when it is time for you to be on the air. When your call is taken, please be ready to turn your volume down. Our phone number is 1-800-322-5385. Now we present Open Forum with our host and Bible teacher, Harold Camping. Good evening. How are you tonight? Again, may I have the privilege and the pleasure of coming into your home to visit with you for a little while. What would you like to talk about this evening on this anonymous telephone program? What subject is of concern to you? You know that on this program we are not finally interested in what I may think is truth or what you might think is truth. We're interested in what the Bible has to say about truth. The Bible is God's book. It reveals the perfect wisdom of God. My, my, we can never pit our wisdom against the wisdom of God. We are helpless, we are hopeless in ourselves, but isn't it wonderful that God has given us a book that we can look at and know that everything that is taught there is trustworthy and dependable and true and altogether authoritative for our lives. The Bible is a book for the human race. It deals with people you and me and everyone else in the world and therefore we are thoroughly delighted and and awestruck struck by the fact that we can use the bible on this program the bible on this program as our authority now before we take our first call from our, our telephone lines we have a listener in new zealand in New Zealand, he, he receives family radio there, and he asks this question. Uh, I noticed a vast difference among Christians, particularly with and or uh, concerning Jehovah Witnesses, and could not discover what is the heart and main discrepancies. Sorry for touching such a complicated subject, but I would be grateful if you could shed some light on this subject and thank you so very much well now that's a very practical question because out there there are numerous religions and gospels that call themselves christian they call themselves christian because they identify to some degree with the bible the main test of whether a gospel is the gospel of the Bible or not, or some pseudo, some counterfeit gospel, is what do they do with the Bible. That is the first main test. The authority that structures and determines what the true gospel is, is the Bible alone and in its entirety. The moment any religion that calls itself Christian is looked at, the first test that has to be asked is, do you believe there is more to divine truth than the Bible alone? And if the answer is, well, yes, we believe God still speaks in dreams or, or visions or tongues or something of that nature, then we know that that is not a gospel that identifies with the gospel. It is a counterfeit gospel. It is not a gospel that can bring salvation. Secondly, if they do not believe the whole Bible is the Word of God, if they only believe that, they're, that the New Testament is important, or if they believe that certain parts of the Bible are not trustworthy at all, then again, we have a false gospel. We do not have the true gospel. The whole Bible, the whole Bible is the Word of God. A second question that could be raised is, what do, does your gospel think about the Lord Jesus Christ? 
there are Gospels like the Jehovah Witnesses who deny that Jesus Christ is eternal God. They believe that he was a super holy man, but that he was not eternal God. Immediately, therefore, it indicates it is a counterfeit gospel because the Bible is crystal clear that Jesus Christ is eternal God. Fact is, if he were any less than eternal God, there would be no Savior. It required that that the one who paid for the sins of those who are to become saved be eternal God as well as man. And that is that fits the Lord Jesus Christ. So that, again, is another test that should be applied. Well, thank you so much, New Zealand, for your very practical question. And now shall we go to our first caller from our telephone lines. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, yes, Mr. Camping. Yes. Uh, I have a very, very, very frightening and serious question. Um, uh, you, you've been saying that we have to come out of church and that we may fellowship with one another. By the way, I am so thankful that I am able to get a hold of you. I'm calling from Baltimore, Maryland. And as you said, we have been fellowshipping. It's four of us in this fellowship. One of us. One of the people still attend church. One of the people still attends church, and I think you said we were supposed to get away from that individual. I wasn't sure how you said we're supposed oh, to do. Oh, excuse that. me. No, that is not true. If uh, we are in this world, and all around us are those who, who uh, there's a few who do follow uh, and want to be altogether obedient to the commandments of God, and there are some who don't quite understand. This friend that is coming there in your fellowship, uh, you keep praying for him. You don't want to uh, stay away from him. You keep praying for him and, and encouraging him to, uh, to uh, see, uh, search the Bible so that he too in time might see the truth of the fact that he ought to leave the congregation. But don't stay away from him. I miss said that I didn't mean that we were supposed to get away, but I, I thought I heard you say that it can be confusing when we're still fellowshipping with those who believe that the church is still uh, being... No, I, I think you misunderstood. You see, if we, if, if, for example, a church would invite you to a prayer breakfast or to some other activity that is under the auspices, under the the uh, supervision of that church, that is what you want to stay away from. But if some members of your church fellowship with you uh, and you yourself have no identity with that church, uh, your fellowship is not a church function. It is not under the authority of your church. Well, the, the reason I'm asking is because in this fellowshipping, there, there is one who has, an, you know, he has an ob obsession with, the 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 six 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 in the Revelations chapter thirteen, and I, he has confided in myself, and I have tried, like you said, to be as faithful as I can in ministering to and in reading and in studying, and it's it's been something that's been ongoing and ongoing, and I thought it was an unhealthy kind of obsession. Well, that but, is that is not a very healthy thing to do. But again, uh, if you pray for him, he has to answer to the Lord for what he does. And if uh, in your fellowship uh, he, he might make some comments, but then I, 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 I spend some time in other parts of the Bible. You don't have to spend time in your fellowship just talking about prophecy or uh, eschatological questions. Uh, you have the whole Bible in front of you. There's all kinds of of uh, material that you can be reading and talking about. Well, well see, we, we have. We have been spending time with that, but this uh, gentleman is concerned with that, that specific thing. And it, 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 when I brought it out to the, to the rest of ourselves that, you know, I'm yes. feeling a little fresher, I would like some help and some prayer, uh, he pointed out that there was a specific mark on his hand. He, he literally believed yeah. that he had the 666 
six six yeah. on his hand, and I thought that that was ridiculous. And I said, you know, it's a little much for me to handle, and I'm going to have to back away because I'm I'm frightened. Well. Yeah. We, we we did see that he did have some sort of mark on his hand that wasn't a skin irritation, and he did have what he was complaining about, and we were beginning to think that maybe it was something psychological. So you you kept saying, as as Peter has said, to make our call and election sure and to constantly examine ourselves. So I have been doing this to myself, and this is something that I had problems with before, and I believe God saved me out of. And now seven years later, here it is right in my face again. And I have tried, I have prayed. Yes. Well, excuse me, excuse me. Now, we must remember that life is not easy. This world is a veil of tears. And, and there's always problems that arise. There is the individual who is married to an unsaved person. There is a person who is married to somebody who doesn't understand the end, uh, end of the church age. You have an individual in your group that is, uh, is uh, making himself a bit of a nuisance because he keeps focusing on this. And uh, you finally, the three of you, if there are four of you all together, the three of you have to say to him, you know, uh, please don't, don't bring up that material any longer. We are not interested. We're not interested, and uh, we want to talk about some other things. And if you are not pleased with our conduct, then you're free. You don't have to be a part of this fellowship. We don't have any membership here, and and just discourage him from continuing. But uh, And then if he insists on bringing it up, well, just turn away from him. In other words, uh, let him just know very politely that that isn't something that you want to talk about. But uh, I pray the Lord for wisdom. God, the Lord has to give you wisdom. And in the meanwhile, be patient, be very patient, because it's only the mercy of God when we have come to any truth. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Am I on? Yes. Good evening. Hello? Yes. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes. Uh, I've been listening to you for a long time, and here the last couple of weeks I've been hearing you talk about the latter rain. Yes. Is this in the Bible? Oh, absolutely, it's in the Bible. We we don't want to bring up anything on family radio that is not based upon the Bible. The Bible is our authority. The Bible talks about an early rain and a latter rain, and that this would be separated by a time of spiritual famine. And uh, uh, as we work that through the Bible, we find that the latter rain is the final season of sending out the gospel into the world as God is bringing the end time harvest of believers in and when that is completed and that won't take very many years at all when that is completed then Christ will come again you mean these exact words are in the Bible the latter rain yes the latter rain let me read for example from James chapter 4 James chapter 4. Let me turn to that a moment. There we read in, uh, in our chapter 5 in verse 7. Be patient therefore brethren unto the coming of the Lord. Behold the husband man waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he receive the early and latter rain. And uh, we read in, uh, in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 32 in Deuteron in Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 2 where God describes what that rain is all about my doctrine shall drop as the rain my speech shall distill as the dew as the small rain upon the tender herb and as the showers upon the grass in other words the teachings of God come down on the on the uh Earth, and there is a spiritual fruit that comes forth that his people do become saved. Or again, God uses that language in a place like 
Deuteronomy chapter 11. In Deuteronomy chapter 11, he says there that uh, in Deuteronomy 11, uh, I will, in verse 14, I will give you the rain of your land in his due season, the first rain and the latter rain, that thou mayest gather in thy corn and thy wine and thine oil. Now the first rain, or the early rain, is began at Pentecost back in A.D. 33. That's when the church age began, and that is the Pentecostal early rain. And that, uh, that continued until the time of the beginning of the Great Tribulation. As a matter of fact, in uh, Deuteronomy 11, it goes on to say in verse 16, as it describes that God will give you the rain in its season, then uh, take heed to yourselves, verse 16 says, that your heart be not deceived, and ye turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. And then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you, and he shut up to heaven, and there be no rain, and that the land yield not her fruit. Now that's what happens between at the end of the early rain, that is the gospel era, as or the church age era, rather. Uh, finally, the church is have become more and more apostate. Uh, that is, they have fallen away from the truth of the Bible to such a high degree that finally God has ended that season, that period of sending out the gospel. And, and now he is again sending out the gospel, but not through the churches. It's what is spoken about in Revelation 7, verse Nine. After this, then the after this applies to the idea that after the churches have done their work and their work has been completed, then after this I saw a great multitude which no man could number. And where where did they who became saved? And and where did they come from? The question is raised in the in the later verses of. Revelation 7, they came out of great tribulation. And so these people identify with the bringing of the gospel in the sense of the latter rain. It's the end of the harvest season. It's the final harvest that is being brought in. How do we know that this is the latter rain, that, that we are already at the end of the church age? Oh, how do we know that? Well, mm -hmm. we know because we uh, know that we are in the time of great tribulation that God speaks about. In uh, Matthew 24, verse uh, 21, for example, God says, uh, uh, There will be great tribulation, such as this world has never known. And then three verses later in verse 24, God defines or gives us an illustration of what is a time of great tribulation. He says, false prophets and false Christs will arise with signs and wonders to lead astray if possible even the elect. And that is what we see all over the world in church after church. It's not in every single church, but it is in the preponderance of all the churches all over the world, a great interest in signs and wonders and the very thing that God is talking about here. And so because we see this and other signs, like people falling over backward is another sign, which God uh, and uh, tells us is a sign that we're there, we know that we're in the time of great tribulation. But at the same time, when we see a ministry like Family Radio uh, freely sending the gospel, the true gospel, the whole counsel of God into all the world, uh, totally uh, different from what is happening in the churches and congregations, then we understand, oh, but God is still sending the gospel out. It's still the time of salvation, and that can only identify with the latter reign. So you don't you don't think there are any churches anymore left in the world? Oh, there are churches all over the world, and a few some of them still are reasonably true to the word of God. But God also indicates that there 
at the beginning of the Great Tribulation, he is finished with the work of the churches. Their work has been done. All those who are to become saved through their ministering the word have become saved. And now he is working outside of the churches. The churches have uh, have been, uh, the Holy Spirit has, is no longer in the midst of them as we read in Second Thessalonians 2. And Satan himself is seated. These dear people think they're serving Christ and actually know the king of their church is now Satan. God has loosed him. God loosed him at the beginning of the great tribulation time. As a matter of fact, remember what Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 15. When you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place. The only holy place that the world knows uh, during the church age is where the gospel has been uh, being offered. That is the holy place because that is where the, if there are any true believers, normally they will be found there. But now the abomination of desolation is there. That is, Satan is ruling there. It is not going to be any more becoming saved. And so he says we have to leave the churches which now have become spiritually called Babylon. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, hello, Mr. Camping. It's nice to talk to you after three years. I'm calling from southeast Missouri, and the only way I've had access to you over the years is through Angel One. Now I have my Sky Angel and I'm listening to your forum through that manner. And I've called several times over the years to get more of your booklets and, and the books you've written. And um, the people I speak to, this is not a complaint. This is just how do I get all of your books you've written? Well, I, 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 have you written four books and they have not sent them to you? I called some on those, but I had... Uh, yeah, they won't send them all, all as one package, but uh, uh, first of all, ask them for a list of the books, and then ask them for one of those books that you don't have. As soon as you get that, call again and ask for another book. In other words, uh, in a short period, you'll have all of them. Okay, but you don't have any tapes or videos of your work and your ministry? Don't have any what? The uh, cassette tapes or anything? Well, yes, you can you can order a, a, like a cassette tape of a when we have a Bible conference. You can order cassette tapes of that. Um, uh, that's the that's the main tapes that are available. Okay. Well, I'm I'm glad to know that, and I've learned more from you in the last three and a half years than from any teacher in this this area of the heartland has uh it's mostly charismatic and then uh works works faith works yeah. salvation and uh we just have very little access to um uh grace plus nothing well so. you know that is really true all over the world and but i'm glad that you're able to listen by sky angel anybody in the united states I can uh, ordinarily get, uh, most often get Sky Angel for, what do you pay, $9 a month or so? And uh, and you can get a family radio 24 hours a day and encourage your neighbors and other people in the, your town that you live to do the same thing. Um, yes, I will. But this is a very poor part of the country, so a lot of people don't have satellite. But uh, if I can get your your works well that'll help me a lot in trying to get things put across correctly okay i've told a lot of people about you i told them the only other person i know of with your understanding was the apostle paul yeah <laughs> well you know you know when you say satellite satellite is available there the problem is they have to spend uh, uh, somewhere between a hundred and two hundred dollars to buy a dish an 18 inch dish that you have also bought i'm sure in order to get, uh, in order to get uh, Sky Angel, and maybe that's a little difficult for them to uh, have funds for. But if they're able to afford that, then they're in business. They can, 
they, uh, for $9 a month or less, they can get 24 hours of family radio every day. Right. Well, I'll let you go, but I bless your work. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Brother Camping. Yes. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. Is my radio disturbing you? No, let's try it. Go ahead. Okay. I oh, maybe it is. I've been in a long Could time. You? I'm calling from New York. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, excuse me, maybe your radio is disturbing. Would you be kind enough to turn it down? Sure. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, the Camping, I have a problem. I'm going to be moving pop here from here in about three months. But I find myself co continuously falling in to adult, excuse me, into adultery a lot. Not not physically, but spiritually. What can I do about that? Well, do you know any scriptures that I could read that could comfort well, me until I leave here? Because I'm here by myself. My husband's not in the same apartment with me. Yeah, well, first of all, the safeguard that we have is the Word of God. I'm glad that you're listening to Family Radio. You keep listening. And and when you find wrong thinking get into your mind, you begin to pray, Oh, Lord, have mercy, have mercy on me. Let me not go down this path. Read Psalm 51, where uh, it was penned after David had committed physical adultery, but it's, uh, it, it indicates the remorse of his heart. Our strength is in the Word of God. We... I have to pray every day, and I say this without uh, any hesitation. I have to pray every day, Oh, Lord, strengthen me that I will do your will. Strengthen me that I might have your wisdom, because I don't trust my mind at all. I don't trust my wisdom. Uh, as spiritually, I have no strength in myself. Oh, Lord, you work in me to will and to do of your good pleasure. Oh, Lord, have mercy on me and help me, because... Uh, if the Lord isn't with me day by day, I know that I'll slip and fall uh, like anybody else. The problem is that this is a single room occupancy, you know, and these are for single people. And every day is a battle, every day, you know, because people are in need. And, you know, this this is an apartment building, but this is this place is very, very tough to live at. Yes, I imagine it is, and so you have to find your comfort in the Word of God. If you could find a fellowship you can attend on Sunday, a group of other believers, that would be helpful, of course. And uh, and the thing to do is try to attend a a um, open forum if we have a live one in your cities or in your neighborhood someplace, or a banquet. I uh, try to, and then maybe you can meet others that you could become acquainted with. Thank you. Each weekday at this time, we bring you Open Forum, a telephone talk program airing questions on biblical issues. This feature of Family Stations Incorporated will continue in just a moment. Without the Bible as an infallible source of truth, where else would we go? If we take away its authority by declaring it to be inaccurate, we have undermined the very Word of God. Some people have done this very thing by seeing supposed errors in the chronology of the Hebrew kings. However, we're offering a free study called The Perfect Harmony of the Numbers of the Hebrew Kings that refutes this dangerous idea and shows how the times of the kings do fit together exactly the way God has written it. Request this free book on the Hebrew Kings today. Call 1-800-543-1495. That's 1-800-543-1495. Or order it on the web at www.familyradio.com. We continue with more of the Open Forum. 
You are invited to call in and ask questions or discuss issues that are related to the Bible. Our number is 1-800-322-5385. That's 1-800-322-5385. When your call goes on the air, please be ready to turn your volume down. Here is our host and Bible teacher, Harold Camping. Before we take our next call from the telephone lines, we have a third letter from our mission team, 20 strong, 20 individuals who are ministering the gospel in the city of Kiev in the Ukraine. That's uh, uh, formerly a, a, an area of Russia, but now it's a separate uh, country. And uh, they are there passing out the Does God Love You track. They have as their goal the passing out of about 300,000 of these tracks. And you know when you can leave 300,000 tracks in a city, uh, it means that there has been an impact upon that city. Particularly if it's a tract like Family Radio's does God Love You tract, and it's written in Ukrainian language so that any of the local citizenry can easily read it, and in it it has more than 40 Bible verses all directed at the, uh, to give a ba basic outline of our need of salvation and how we are to relate to God in this matter. Well, this letter is number three, and it starts out with a verse from Psalm 105, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people. And that's the whole task of Family Radio. And may we do it very thankfully that God allows us to have just a little part in this grand global mission activity of sending the gospel into the world by radio by uh, internet and by track distribution and by satellite and so on. Well, here's the letter. Today our team in Kiev experienced a second day of witnessing on the streets. The reception of our tracks was wonderful and a great improvement on our initial try yesterday. Everyone was ecstatic with the results and we searched during our Bible study time for answers to questions that had been asked us during the day. The focus of our day was markets, were various markets where the poor of the city frequently uh, purchased their goods. In every city we find our best distribution always seems to occur here. Our team of missionaries brought boxes of Bibles and tracts, and a great number of shoppers gravitated toward them. Many joyful people left with perhaps their first Bible. What better gift can we give a person but God's eternal word? A young man approached one of our missionaries carrying a Bible he had just received from another family radio team member. member. He held it up and pointed to his friend. Can I have one for my girlfriend? He said, using exaggerated motions. The missionary hesitated, and then decided that inasmuch as the youngster asked for a Bible, he would certainly provide one for his friend. But how? nevertheless, the thought that ran through our missionary's mind was, were they collecting them to sell? That thought, however, was quickly dispelled when the two friends began to hug each other and praising the Lord as they walked away, each of them, with their Bible. We tend to quickly judge others, even in matters such as this, but our Lord God very often steers us in the right direction. Drunks seem to be a real problem in this city. Today, one of the marketplaces was overloaded with people under the influence of alcohol. We have to keep a constant watch on our women at this time, in these times, because these same drunks 
always seem to gravitate over to them to want to talk. We usually critique our everyday occurrences when we meet after dinner, and this helps to pinpoint any problems so that we can better deal with them. Do we give a drunk a tract? If he puts out his hand to receive one, the answer is always yes. Let me relate a little personal experience. When uh, the first time we were in Russia, and uh, I was there also passing out tracks, we were down in the in the um, metro, and uh, the cars came by about every three or four minutes. And and normally what we did is we we would uh, get on a car and then walk through the, the the length of the car, passing out tracks, and then get off at the next station. And then uh, there we would wait for a few minutes and get on the next uh, car that came by, the next train that came by, and walk through the the, uh, the car again, passing out tracks. And, and by that time, we just about came to the next station and we'd get out and so on. And we were able to pass out an enormous number of tracks. Well, we were on one uh, one platform waiting for the next car and uh, uh, two or three of us. And there was a drunken man there who was harassing a, a couple of the others and really becoming a, a, a real nuisance. So I walked over and... Uh, to uh, draw his attention away from these two individuals so they could go on about their business. And uh, then he began to harass me. So I slowly on, when the next train came through, I walked over and and stood with my back against the sliding door that opens up uh, to allow the passengers to get on and off. And made like I was going to get on. And, uh, and so... Uh, I, I kind of made a little movement, and my drunken friend got on also because he wanted to con- continue to harass me. But the moment I felt a little movement in my um, in my back that they wanted to shut the door, I stepped aside back on the platform, the door shut, and my drunken friend went on to the next station. Well, that was a very interesting little experience that I had with drunks. But this was a... This is can be a problem, and so I can understand our team's concern about this because you don't like to have any kind of a of a uh, rhubarb develop a, a, a confrontation of some kind. It takes finesse, it takes prayer, it takes uh, uh, patience, and uh, and yet it's something that that has to be dealt with on these mission tours. But it, it seems like, particularly in that area of the world, this is more of a problem than in some other areas. Maybe it's, well, I'm not going to get into why it might be. Let's go back to the letter. A second team visited a Bible institute with over 80 persons, or 80 students. Many did not have Bibles. And there were a few others that only had a New Testament with the Psalms. We tried to give a Bible to everyone who needed one. How can a Bible student study the Bible when he doesn't have one of his own? Now, nobody in this institute needs to experience this hurt. Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day, we read in Psalm 119. There are cleaning ladies carrying brooms throughout the city of Kiev, When you travel through the streets, you immediately see the work they put in daily. Naturally, they look at us with mistrust. Because you see, they see us passing out tracks, and uh, some are discarded on 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 the pavement or on the sidewalk, and that means it in it makes their work a little more tedious, a little more difficult, and they don't like it, obviously. So we try to keep them happy at, and at the same time provide a good witness by picking up nearly every discarded tract. This is a necessary portion of every missionary's work. In some cities, there are very few discarded tracts. In others, there are more. But in either case, when they are discarded, they must be 
picked up fairly promptly so that we didn't uh, so that the the mission team's testimony will be a a good testimony in that city we continue to praise our lord for this grand opportunity god has given us to share his word please pray that we might stay strong and continue to want to help these people to be given the word of god not only should we be praying for the missionaries but we want to be praying for those who are receiving these tracts surely among them there are god's elect we don't know who they are but god knows who they are and we want to pray that the word of god will work in their hearts that god the holy spirit will apply that word to their hearts and that indeed there will be many who will become saved colossians 2:16 is the closing verse of this letter let the word of christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom teaching and admonish and and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing with grace in your hearts to the lord in christian love the 2002 family radio mission team in kiev ukraine well thank you for that letter and now we're going to go back to our our telephone lines are open for him shall we take our next call please good evening welcome to open forum good evening sir how you doing very well thank you i got a quick cool question um i'm in the military i've been in marine corps for a few years now um i believe in god i read the bible and i'm just wondering can a person in the military be saved because they you know being in the military we got to defend our country They, uh, the, qu- the question is, is when we join the military do we put ourselves out of the possibility of being a child of God and the answer is no not at all in fact God very carefully gives us the record in Acts chapter 8 or chapter 9 of a Roman centurion he would be a captain over a hundred men he would be under the authority of a pagan roman government that knew uh, nothing about the bible and yet uh, when cornelius this roman uh, centurion became saved there is a one word in the bible that he could no longer be a roman centurion as a roman centurion in obeying his his captain it would mean that there would be times when he might have to take life as he defended his country or protect the citizenry but uh, that is a bona fide a, a, a proper role for a citizen of a land to, to be in because God has established um, by his by God's divine mandate that there be government that uh, that is raises up uh, the necessary means to protect the citizenry so being in the military is not a a a does not di- discourage in any way the becoming of a child of god however being in the military may also present a lot of extra t- temptations there are many men in military uniform who by uh, abandon themselves to the lusts of this world particularly if they go to a, a, a city outside of their home city uh and uh, you must also think of this that god has placed you in the military but you are still an ambassador of the lord jesus christ because you are one of the military you are in a particularly good place to be a witness to others and so uh you uh you want not only by your lifestyle but as you seek opportunity maybe to pass out does god love you tracks which you can obtain free of charge from family radio uh to your fellow uh, uh soldiers uh you can also be a real witness for the lord jesus christ thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum good evening welcome to open forum hello good evening welcome hello? to open forum good evening mr camping yes 
Yes, Mr. Camping. I, before I, I go to the questions that I am asking you tonight, I would like you to explain to me, very shortly, of course, what do you mean by are you truly saved? Uh, is there a difference between someone who is saved and someone who is truly saved? Oh, okay, that's a fair question. The Lots of people say they are saved, they are born again, because they have done certain action, they have, others have told them that they are saved, but in actuality they are not saved. To be truly saved means that God has done a miracle in that person's life. He has given him a brand new resurrected soul, which is an integral part of his personality, just as much as his body. And, uh, and in his new resurrected soul, he will never want to sin again. He will have an earnest desire to be obedient to everything the Bible teaches. And uh, that's being truly saved. It's, it's the salvation of the Bible, not the salvation of man. If person is saved, uh, it's, not, it's not real? Well, I guess what we're talking about is semantics. There, there are those who claim they are saved and they think it is real, and yet, uh, and yet, uh, they're going to end up at the judgment throne because they have been saved in accordance to what they think salvation is, but God Himself has not done any work in them. God has not given them a new resurrected soul. However, because they think they are saved, they desperately try to live like a saved person. They try to follow the rules of the Bible. But if God has not saved them, it is not, it's, they really have not become saved at all. They claim they are saved, but it's not true salvation. Well, okay, I will leave this uh, as, you, uh, as your language. Anyway, I would like to speak about something I call you tonight because uh, it seems to me that you are saying things that uh, I, it puzzles me. First of all, uh, I, I listen to you very carefully. Uh, on June 27 of the year 2000, uh, you said, and I, I quote, you said, some people never become saved because God never gave them spiritual ears to hear. Now, according to what you have said, and I like to use that word because I have to go by what you have said, uh, when someone says something that you believe or it is not biblical, then you say uh, those people are preaching or saying the wrong thing. They are not talking, uh, talking the word of God. They are, they are false. They are saying some things that are false. Now, when you say something that is not right, of course, you, 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 you very seldom even admit that. You say, well, the Lord had not opened my spiritual eyes. But if for other people, you do not say it is because the Lord had not opened their spiritual eyes, but for you, you said it is because the Lord had not opened their spiritual eyes. Well, I, I, What are you talking me. about? Well, huh? excuse me. The fact is that any truth that we have from the Bible, it means that God has to open our spiritual eyes. And I can, I use myself as an illustration. It doesn't mean that I'm saying that God, uh, that other people don't have the same problem. Uh, the the fact is, if we come to truth, it is only because God has opened our spiritual eyes. First of all, the uh, the matter of salvation is nothing we do. God is the one who has to save us. He is the one who has to really uh, open our spiritual eyes uh, so that we know that we're sinners and that we know that Christ is is our savior only god can do that we can't do it ourselves and even after we're saved there's a we learn from the scriptures but we don't learn it all at once we we uh, anytime we come to truth in the scriptures it is because god has to open our spiritual eyes so in other words okay now let, let us look at what you were saying you say that the people who 
whom God, whom God had predestined will be saved. And then the people whom God, according to what you are saying, you say that those whom God had not predestined, they will not be saved. Well, that's not what I'm saying. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1 that he chose those whom he has saved from before the foundation of the world to be conformed to his will and predestinated them to salvation. Now, he didn't predestinate everybody to salvation in, in uh, Revelation chapter uh, 13 there in verse 7 he says there are those who are not were not named in the Lamb's book of life from before the foundation of the world and now we we may not like that but that's what God's declaration is that in his sovereign goodwill as he uh, uh, in his sovereign uh, will as he says in Romans 9 I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and uh, and we don't dictate to God. God is the one who makes those decisions. Let, let us look at it realistically. Let us look at it. Everybody is born according to what I know. If I'm wrong, tell me I'm wrong. Everybody is born in, in sin. Once you are born, you are conceived in your mother's womb as a sinner. Is that correct? Yes that or is, no? That is altogether correct. You have that right. Okay, let me continue. Okay, if you are conceived as a sinner in your mother's womb, and you had absolutely nothing to do with that, zero, okay, and then if you are predestined, you will be saved, and if you are not predestined, you will be condemned. So in other words, it really doesn't make any difference when you die. If you die when you are a a, a, a baby or you die as an old man uh, it means that if you are one of God's predestined you will be saved and if you are not one of God's predestined you will not be saved and there is nothing anyone can do about his salvation is that correct that is correct God is uh, if God has elected us to salvation he has obligated himself to save us and what he will do is put that individual under the hearing of the word if he's going to save that child that person as a little baby that baby already will be under the hearing of the word because that is the environment in which God will do the saving faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God but and and, and uh, this uh, this is totally God's program and that's why when people ask me I, I like to get saved. What I, can I do? I said, you can't do anything. God has to save you. You can put yourself in the environment of where God does save, namely the, the hearing of the Word of God, and you have the luxury of praying to God that as to get His attention or oh, have mercy, have mercy. God uh, not only allows that, but He wants us to do that. But those actions in themselves are not going to get you saved. God has to do the whole work of salvation. And, and uh, all we know is, is that God does everything perfectly. We don't understand a whole lot of, about it. But, and we know that not one of us deserves salvation. It's only the mercy of God, the grace of God, that anyone does become saved. You believe in somehow that you are a radical Calvinist? Well, I never, I don't identify with with uh, 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 whether I'm Calvinist or Lutheran or 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 Swinglian or or anything else. I, uh, what I want to identify is with the Bible, just what the Bible says. You never hear me quote from John Calvin or Knox or Luther or. Uh, any anyone else? I just quote from the Bible. When you said to the whole world that the the end of time was going to come on September 4, 1994, it was going to be the end of humanity. It Excuse was going to be me. the end of the world. Excuse me, I never said that. I never said that. That is not true. I said that there was a likelihood 
that Christ would come sometime in 1994, but not September 4th. I never picked a date, uh, and and uh, but because I, no man knows the day or the hour. But I said it was li- it li- there was a likelihood he would come, and it could might it might be in the fall of the year. But uh, that's that's as uh, I also uh, definitely indicated that. That, uh, but there is also a possibility he's not coming, and he didn't come. Listening, go ahead. I, I thank you very much. Thank you for calling and Bye. sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes. Good uh, evening. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Brother Camping? Yes. Uh, I've been listening to you, and this is the end of the church age? According to what the Bible teaches, God has various seasons for sending out the gospel. And a major season that God had planned for sending out the gospel was what we call the church age. It went on for over 1950 years. But then that isn't the, there's another season that still had to come. That's the season of the final harvest or the season of the latter rain. And that's the season that we're in right now. Which, and, and God gives us a lot of information to indicate that the season of the churches came to an end and that uh, its work was finished. Well, I heard uh, on family radio, I listen to it all the time, that uh, someone this morning, one of your speakers said, we should not forget to worship this Sunday. We should go to church. Well, now, occasionally, uh, we, we try to be as clear, careful as possible, but we, we uh, sometimes use a, a program, reuse a, pro, uh, a speaker that we used some time back, or uh, sometimes it is a program that was uh, aired uh, a couple years ago, and it has not been corrected. So occasionally, something like that slips in, but that is not our intention. Our intention is to be as consistent as possible that uh, we are not to go to church on Sunday. We are to come out of the churches. That is what the Bible teaches. Well, about a year ago or so, I thought I heard you teach that the end of the church age would be when all the churches had become apostate and there would be no more true doctrine. Well, now... Bear in mind that uh, I don't know all the answers immediately. Uh, I study all the time. I study the Bible. I don't study anything else. I study the Bible. And uh, and uh, slowly on, I learn more and more. There was a time when I questioned, does that mean that there's not a single church that can still uh, continue? And I wasn't sure. And so I may have made a statement like that. But now as I have... Uh, continued studying the Bible and everything is becoming clearer and clearer uh, to me I know that we should not be in any church of uh, at all because uh, God is finished with the whole business of churches and congregations thank you for calling and sharing weekday at this time, we bring you Open Forum, a telephone talk program airing questions on biblical issues. This feature of Family Stations Incorporated will continue in just a moment. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 here describes why Family Radio seeks to share God's word with you and other listeners each and every day. Now, Family Radio is still an excellent way to share scripture with those who cannot read it for themselves. Perhaps they're blind or have impaired vision or are in hospital, or for those of us who just don't seem to have enough time to read scripture daily. This is just one of our many 
many ministries daily that you support when you help the Family Radio Ministry monthly. And if you would like to share God's Word, you may do so by sharing a generous love offering this month by sending it to Family Radio, Oakland, California, 94621. That's Family Radio, Oakland, California, 94621. Thank you. We continue with more of the Open Forum. You are invited to call in and ask questions or discuss issues that are related to the Bible. Our number is 1-800-322-5385. That's 1-800-322-5385. When your call goes on the air, please be ready to turn your volume down. Here is our host and Bible teacher, Harold Camping. We're continuing with the Open Forum program, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Campy? Yes. Hi. I would like to find out more about um, the Sabbath day. Like, if you are not a seven-day Adventist person and you want to go to church on, well, I thought you have to go to church on Sundays, but now I'm a little baffled because you're saying to stay out of the churches, and then I want to know um, how do... How to keep that Sabbath day, don't go to work at all, you know, explain some more of that to me. Well, that's a very good question. You know, God uh, addresses that question of all places in Isaiah 58. Uh, the, the, chapter of Isaiah, the chapter of Isaiah 58 is really uh, like a New Testament chapter. It is dealing with how uh, we are to... Uh, 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 worship how we are to live throughout the New Testament era and in Isaiah 58 God says this uh, in verse 13 if thou turn thy foot away from the Sabbath from doing thy pleasure excuse me if thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath that is from doing thy will on the Sabbath from doing thy pleasure on my holy day in other words Christ is calling the Sabbath my holy day and call the sabbath a delight the holy of the lord honorable and shalt honor him not doing thine own ways nor finding thine own pleasure nor speaking thine own words then shalt thou delight thyself in the lord all right now here god is giving us a an outline of how we are to conduct ourselves on the Sunday Sabbath. We're not to do our pleasure, not to do our will, not to speak our words. We are to have that day focused on honoring God and, uh, and uh, doing what is pleasing to Him. Now, the Lord gave some illustrations of that. The first illustration was right on the very first day of creation. That was Sunday, the same day that we uh, uh, have the New Testament Sabbath day. And what did Christ do on that first day? He said, let there be light. And that light was physical light, but nevertheless it was a dramatic picture of the fact that Christ would come as the light of the world. That physical light was illustrating or representing the gospel going out into all the world. And so the first great piece of information we have that help us to understand how to keep the Sunday Sabbath is it is a day for sharing the gospel. As we share the gospel with others, we're letting the light of the gospel shine in the world. Secondly, uh, the uh, fact is that when Christ rose from the grave, he experienced the resurrection. It was on Sunday morning. And when Christ arose, that was a picture, or, or he was the first fruits of all those who would experience the resurrection from the dead. And, and how do we experience resurrection from the dead? That happens when we become saved. So again, we see that Sunday is focused on the matter of sharing the gospel so others might experience the spiritual resurrection from death to spiritual life. In other words, that they might become saved. Then God gave a third illustration. 
Uh, the day of Pentecost in A.D. 33 was a very propitious day. It was a day in which about 3,000 people were saved. And that also was on a Sunday. Now notice, let there be light, the resurrection of Christ, the saving about 3,000. What are they, what do they have in common? The common denominator is the, the gospel bringing salvation. So that becomes the dominant thought of those, of what we ought to be thinking about on, on the Sunday Sabbath. Now, we, we uh, are doing his will. It's God's will to read the word of God, to fellowship together around the word of God, to sing songs of praise to God, to share the gospel, visit those who are in need of the gospel, visit old people's homes or jails or stand on the street corner with tracts or uh, visit friends to try to encourage them in the word of God and so forth. Uh, for many, it w will be a day mainly just of reading the Word, reading, reading, in order to be better qualified to share the Word whenever that opportunity may arise. And so, uh, of course, we don't want to mess up that day by conducting our own pleasure. The Bible says you know, don't do your own will. You don't have to mow the lawn that day. You don't have to paint your house. You don't have to do any uh, of those uh, things that that will keep until the six uh, other days of the week concentrate upon spiritual activity. Thank you, Brother Campy. Bye. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes, good evening. Uh, let me Welcome to Open Forum. <clears throat> yeah, I'm calling about uh, Acts 2, uh, verse uh, 17 to uh, 21. Yes. Well, there you see in Acts 2, God is describing the beginning of that season of the early reign and the pen when which began at Pentecost and goes throughout the the uh, church age the uh, the and in acts 2 verse 17 uh, he is he is saying uh, it shall come to pass in the last days because the new testament era uh, are the last days the world had been going on for 11,000 years before and now there are about 2,000 years left, and these are called the last days. And here God is describing how, the, how he will get his gospel out. Before uh, Pentecost here of Acts 2, it was only occasional that God named someone as a prophet, like Jeremiah or Ezekiel or Abraham or David or Moses. But here God is saying, in the last days, and these are the last days, I will, that is beginning at Pentecost 2,000 years ago, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. That is, every true believer, by the, at the moment they become saved, will not only be commissioned to be a prophet, but will be qualified to God by God to be a prophet. Now what does a prophet prophesy? The Word of God. Back in those days they didn't have the whole Word of God. Uh, they, they only had a partial written word and so God was still bringing messages through dreams and visions. And he indicates this, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. In other words, that is God's plan, that both men and women are to, to declare the word of God. Now, once the Bible was completed, a few decades later, the idea of someone still receiving divine truth by a dream or a vision or a tongue or a voice, that was no longer possible because the, 
Bible is the complete and only revelation from which we are to prophesy. Whenever we share the Word of God to someone, share part of the Bible to someone, we are prophesying. And that is, that is what God has indicated here. Well, it goes on, 19, 20, 21. Well, and I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. All right, now, prior, just prior to this, all of these physical things did take place. When Christ was hanging on the cross, and that was just a few weeks before this this uh, change came when every true believer would be a prophet, there was... Uh, there was the blood of Christ that was that that came from His side. There was the uh, great earthquake. There, the whole uh, earth uh, that area became uh, uh, darkened for three hours. The sun did not shine, uh, and uh, and uh, so on. And and there was judgment. The new moon turned into blood. It's a figure of speech to indicate that the law now is getting its due because Christ was under the judgment of God. And all of that was necessary before this change in God's methodology of sending out the gospel would take place, namely, that every true believer would become a prophet. And then in verse uh, 21 it says, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And the only ones who will call on the name of the Lord in a way that is pleasing to God are those whom God has saved. So this all happened already then? This happened in Jerusalem, indeed, yes. That doesn't mean uh, the day of the Lord come. That doesn't mean the uh, end of the world. When the Bible talks about the day of the Lord or that day or judgment day, that is the last day of the earth's existence. It is the end of the world. So uh, <clears throat> this already happened, but uh, this won't happen before the day of the Lord comes. Then. Oh, well, now... This, you know, actually there are two judgment days that the Bible knows about. One is when Christ was judged, there uh, just a few weeks ahead of Pentecost here, and he, he bore the wrath of God on behalf of all those who are to become saved. And that wrath had to be equivalent of, to all those who were to become saved, spending an eternity in hell. On the other hand, on the last day, the day of the Lord, there will be another judgment day, and at that time, all those who were not covered by Christ's blood, that is, for whom he had not already paid for their sins, they will stand for judgment on their own behalf. And again, God will pour out his wrath, and it won't be the equivalent of eternity in hell. It will be the actuality of these individuals cast into hell forevermore. So, and that judgment day at the cross was just as terrifying, just as terrible. Uh, we don't know a whole lot about it because uh, how did God punish Christ who never ceased to be God? We don't know. We don't know. But we know because of God's perfect integrity, perfect justice, what Christ endured had to be equal to what the unsaved will endure throughout eternity at the end of the world. And thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we? And that's you see why we send the gospel into the world, because I, we are praying and trusting that God will save a great many people as they are hearing the word of God. And and in fact, the Bible indicates He will save a great many people. He speaks of a great multitude which no man can number that will become saved at this time in history. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Camping. Can you uh, define the gospel uh, for your viewers? Well, the gospel is simply the whole Bible. The gospel 
is the good news of salvation. Now, it isn't only good news. It's the we can't understand good news until we see the terrible fact uh, that we're sinners and we're under the wrath of God. But then the rest of the story is there is good news that those who have come to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ do become saved. And the gospel, therefore, cannot be separated either from the whole Bible nor from Christ himself. Christ is the very essence of the gospel. So the, you would say as well uh, that the person and work of Christ is uh, the gospel, because if someone doesn't believe in the person or his work, uh, then that they have a false gospel. Well, we, it's, more, it's more than that, you know. Uh, there are those who claim they believe in the person and work of the Lord Jesus, and they have no idea what salvation is. They, they, uh, they may not believe the whole Bible is the Word of God. It's more than just the person and work of the Lord Jesus. It is the whole Bible. That is the gospel. I understand uh, you cannot define the person or the work of Christ without the whole Bible, because I believe the whole Bible. But... Um, there is a, a definite message that uh, Christ uh, declared, you know, to believe on him, and those who believe on him shall be saved. But you often mention uh, or say that, you know, we need to cry out for mercy, and, and, uh, but never really define the person and work of Christ. I mean, I, I, know, you, I know you believe he's God in, in, uh, in the flesh, and and uh, he atoned for his people. Well, excuse me. Christ came to seek and to save those that are lost. Now, what did he have to do to save us? He, he had to take upon himself the sins of those that he planned to save. He didn't take upon himself, upon himself the sins of every human being because then everybody would, there would be nobody in hell. But only those that he planned to save, uh, then... He, uh, he had to be found guilty, which he was found guilty. Then he had to pay the penalty for those sins that is demanded by the law of God. Then he had to apply that word of God to the lives of those he planned to save. And in other words, the work of Christ is 100% the work of Christ in getting us saved. There's nothing that we can add to or or uh, to take any credit for or, or initiate uh, salvation. When God tells us to believe on him, yes, that's what happens when we have become saved. We do believe on him. We've hung our whole life on him. But we cannot believe on him until God saves us. The Bible is clear, and this is an integral part of the gospel, that we're spiritually dead. We're like a valley of dry bones. We're like Lazarus, who was physically dead, a stinking corpse in the tomb. And, and we also have to remember that's an integral part of the gospel message. And we, we have to keep all of that in mind if we're going to understand altogether what the gospel is. Um, I, I agree 100%. But there is, when you give, uh, when you say that uh, people are saved, they have a, an ongoing, earnest desire to do the will of God. But the real evidence is that they believe in Christ and, and, and the Bible, of course. They have to believe in the Bible in order to believe in Christ. But there is, you know, a, an ongoing, earnest desire. An Arminian can have an ongoing, earnest desire, and yet he believes in a false Christ and a false gospel. Well, no, we don't have an earnest desire to do the will of God when we countenance false doctrine. One of the characteristics of a true believer is that he wants his doctrine to be as faithful as possible to the Word of God. And if he suspects that he believes something that is uh, not altogether faithful to the Word of God, he's going to be troubled until he makes correction. Moreover, the characteristic of the true believer is that he has a love for God. And the love for God involves keeping God's commandments. And God's commandments are not only how we walk morally, but also what we believe concerning salvation. So if we hold a gospel that uh, believes that uh, I became saved because I reached out, or I became baptized in water, or this or that is what I did, and that 
uh, that guaranteed my salvation or initiated my salvation, it means I don't believe in Christ. I don't love him. I, I, I have my own kind of a gospel. I, 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 I've convinced myself I do love him, but I don't really measure up to what the, what the Bible demands. We read in John 14, verse 21, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. Uh, or again, in verse 23 of John 14, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him. And uh, to keep his words means that we're going to be ready to be obedient to any doctrine of the Bible, as as soon as we know what that what that doctrine is, we or say it the other way, we have a, a tremendous desire to be altogether faithful to anything and everything the Bible teaches. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, um, Brother Camping. Yes. You've mentioned many times about, you talked a lot about the Sabbath day, but I would like you to take a look at Hebrews 4, 2 to, 7, 2 to 11. Yes, in Hebrews 4, God is talking there about the rest that we have in the Lord Jesus when we have become saved. The seventh day Sabbath was a ceremonial law in which there was not to be any physical work of any kind. They were, the individuals were to rest entirely from that. And that was a sign pointing to the fact that God has done all the work to save us. And that's why we read in Hebrews 4 that uh, in verse 9, there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that has entered into his rest, that is, who have trusted in God, for that he has done all the work to save us, and we have done none of the work in trying to get us sa- or get ourselves saved, he also has ceased from his own works. He, he doesn't trust in anything he has done to get saved, as God did his did from his let us labor that is let us be diligent therefore to enter into that rest the rest of, uh, of of ceasing from trying to get saved by any work that we do lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief that that so many have fallen because they they uh, even as they worked on the seventh day sabbath as they which was a picture of all of this, so there are those who are trying to work their own works to assist somehow in getting themselves saved. But it doesn't say that at all. I think the callers need to read this carefully because that is not what it's saying at all. Oh, excuse me, that is what it's saying. I am simply summarizing it by reading these verses very carefully in verse 4 he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise and god did rest the seventh day from his works and if we read about that seventh day in the old testament we read again and again that the that god gave the seventh day rest to as a sign that i the lord sanctify you remember the 10 commandments of revelation of of deuteronomy Excuse me. Yeah, Deuteronomy 5. Yeah, there's, uh, there's almost the same as Ex- the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. But when it comes to the fourth commandment, it says, You are to keep the seventh day Sabbath uh, because I, the Lord, have brought you out of the land of Egypt. Now, what did that have to do with the seventh day Sabbath? They were brought out of the land of Egypt as a picture of salvation. I, the Lord, sanctify thee. Remember in Numbers 15, there was a man who picked up a few sticks on the seventh day Sabbath. And God told Moses to kill that man, to stone him to death. Why such a terrible punishment for such a minor infraction of the seventh day? Because that man was a picture of someone who 
claims that he's saved by the grace of God, but he also did a tiny bit of effort, a tiny bit of work to get credit for in getting himself saved. He reached out, or he was baptized in water, or he did something else, and that's like a man who picked up a few sticks. That was the focal point of the seventh-day Sabbath. Now, those who are still trying to hold the seventh-day Sabbath, they are in violation of the Word of God because God indicates in Colossians 2 that the new moons, the feast days, the uh, laws concerning meat and drink, and the Sabbaths were a shadow of things to come. That is, they were pointing to something. And so the seventh-day Sabbath was pointing to what? That the, the, it was pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ who would do all the work to save us. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our last call tonight, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Yes. I have a scripture to read. Go ahead. Okay. That... If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For the heart of man believe unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And of course that is absolutely true. But let me ask you another question. The Bible teaches that before we're saved, we're like a valley of dry bones. That is a figure that God gives us in uh, Ezekiel chapter 37. Now tell me, if we're a, a valley of dry bones, there's no life of any kind. We're spiritually dead, spiritually a corpse. How are we going to believe in him? How are we going to, uh, to confess him? How are we going to do that? Well, hands down, it's the Lord putting his Holy Spirit in us to, to call on him. That's why he says, come unto me. Oh, but, but when, uh, you mean he gives everyone the Holy Spirit so that they potentially can call on him? That isn't what the Bible teaches. The fact is we're dead, and only those that God is saving does the Holy Spirit apply the Word of God to our lives so we do become saved? Remember the illustration of John 11? Lazarus was physically dead in the tomb. He was a corpse. He was a stinking corpse, the Bible says. And Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth, just as he tells us to believe. How did it happen that Lazarus could come forth? ponder that and then you'll understand what is required for our salvation but now I have to say good night because we've run out of time I'm sorry until our next open forum may the Lord richly bless you Family Stations Incorporated has featured Open Forum, a telephone talk program of biblical discussion with host Harold Kemp. You're invited to tune in every weekday at this time. All correspondence relating to the Open Forum should be sent to Family Stations Incorporated, Oakland, California, 94621. That's Family Stations Incorporated, Oakland, California, 94621. When writing, please indicate the call letters of this station. If you are not able to call in on this broadcast, we invite you to try again on a future open forum. Due to the nature of this type of call-in program, the opinions expressed are those of the participants. Open Forum is a production of Family Stations Incorporated.